Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the only show that invites you to pull up a chair, sit down, and pull your TTRPG books and join us at the table. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit more about some of the amazing ancestries that Paizo just recently released. Uh, we're going to be going over a versatile heritage and a brand spanking new full heritage. Before we get into that, let's do a quick hello and how do you do to Mr. Michael Powell. Mr. Michael Powell, please tell us who you are and where we can find you on that sweet, sweet internet. Well, I am Michael Powell, and um, yeah, you can find me all over the internet on my social medias, which is at Mr. Kapow, that's M-R-K-A-P-A-O, and how about you? My name is PJ McGaw. I'm all over the internet at PJ.McGaw. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Come find me. Let's have a great time. Uh, and when I'm out here on Tuesdays, you can find me Wednesdays on Edge of Legends, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, but... Without further ado, let's get cracking and, and lacking with the new ancestries from the Lost Domains Ancestry Guide. We have two coming up. The first one is going to be a versatile heritage. And this one's kind of cool, especially for all you OC fans out there. Yeah. Um, I like the art, the, the two pieces of art they have here on yeah. the website. <laughs> Absolutely. So... Yeah. The first one, the versatile heritage we're talking about is called the Beast Kitten. And as we discuss these uh, ancestors, we're going to talk about different ways you can build a character around them and different ways you can put them into your campaign, you know, and maybe yeah. role play as well. Yeah, and I also want to point out that um, these, these, ah, these ancestries and heritages can be found in the new Pathfinder Lost Omens Ancestry Guide. Absolutely. It's... it's Lost Omens books are so mm -hmm. full of awesome content because, like, you have the core rulebook and the dance core rulebook, lots of great stuff. But if you're like, man, my character is so good, but I want some extra spice to it, Lost Omens got you covered. Hey, do you want to be a Warhammer 40k zealot in a fantasy world? Hell knight. Do you want to be a living cactus who's got anger issues? Leshy. Do you want to be a weird version of Elf? Everything in between. Yeah. So oh. I think this, I, I, I kind of want to say this book introduced like fifth, about 15 or so uh, new ancestries and heritages. Yeah, and the art in the book alone is worth it. I mean, if not for creative inspiration, then just like general questions. Like, for example, what does an Asimar Kobold look like? Go to the book. There's an Asimar Kobold hanging out with a tiefling ratkin. It is amazing. Um... But well, without further ado, let's talk about this beastkin. Now, this is a versatile heritage. And this is important to state because, like we mentioned earlier with the Asimar Cobalt, how do you get such an unusual combination? That's where the versatile heritage comes in. You are allowed at level one to kind of build this versatile heritage into your main heritage, kind of like what half-orcs and half-elves were for humans. Um, Mr. Michael Powell, would you rather read the, the background or should I? I'll, I'll do it. All right, um, beastkin have extraordinary abilities derived from the animal world, allowing them to partially or fully transform into animals, granting them deadly fangs, refined senses, and other traits. A beastkin tends, oh, treads the line between nature and society, living with a foot and each. And I also kind of want to say, uh, do you mind if I uh, just make a comment real quick? Sure. About this? Uh, beastkin is kind of like, uh, as you said before, were creatures like a werewolf or something but you're not necessarily confined to just werewolves because you could be like a werebug a were jaguar maybe even a, a were bear a were crab i want to see a were crab listen if you want to return to monkey may i also offer evolve to crab yeah <laughs> but uh yeah uh do you want me to continue on with uh, at least the first paragraph? Uh, absolutely, please continue. All right. Beastkin is a blanket term for any person who has gained the ability to partially or fully transform into an animal through any number of means while maintaining a balance with their humanoid side. Most beastkins are born of were creatures or have a were creature ancestor in their lineage. lineage. The curse might not always fully manifest in the child the were creature pairing, giving the child the transform transformative nature of their lineage without weakness to silver 
or a loss of control during the full moon. Born or made, were creatures usually hold such beastkin in high regard as they embody many of the, their strength without any of their weaknesses. Another thing I really like about this because you don't have to have, unless you choose to, you do not have to have the traditional weaknesses of were creatures like silver or, or being forced to transform during like one of the lunar cycles. Yeah, or that, that wonderful GM gift and burden of like, well, now that I'm insane, here's my character sheet. Can you kill my partners with me? And you're sitting there as a GM going, oh, yes, I will. But I, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think uh, Reap Psyche and Maynard in chat is digging the were crab idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can definitely look at the stats as we go forward. I think that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. Make the were crab pirates, boy. Yeah. Oh, I just thought of something else. Wear sloth. Oh my god. Moves. I love that. <laughs> in my in my brain the wear sloth has a speed of sixty, but they have to make a willpower save to actually use the sixty. Otherwise they're like at like they go in like mm -hmm. ten feet every turn. Like I, I will say a uh sloth, they do have these really wicked claws. They do. And I learned some other gross stats about sloths, mm -hmm. but that's not important. What's yeah. important is Beastkin. Mm -hmm. um, where were we? Oh, oh I just read the intro. Uh, do you want to yes. go into the, the stats, the mechanics, the crunchy bits? Of course, let's get the, the let's croutons. get down to, cr oh, the crunchy, crunchy croutons. So, the versatile heritage, uh, like I said earlier, this is a rare, uh, well, I didn't say this, that it is rare, it mm -hmm. is rare, but this can be added to other ancestries as well. Uh, so basically, when it comes time to pick the heritage of the, let's say, a dwarf in this case, um, funny story, I was doing a Pathfinder 1 campaign, and I had a player who's like, I want to be a dwarf, but I want to be a dwarf that's also a were-tiger. And I was like, oh, how am I going to do that? So I, I BS'd some were-tiger background, and we went on from there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so instead of taking your normal dwarf heritage, in this case, you're going to take the versatile heritage of the beastkin. Uh, and then you get that kind of fun OC that combines both. The yeah. blood of a beast flows through your veins, granting you the ferocity and might of animals. Only creatures with a humanoid trait can take the beastkin, beastkin versatile heritage. Use a type of animal such as bat, eagle, shark, spider, tyrannos, tyrannosaurus. Ha! Yes! Rules is written. T Rex. You could be. You could be a T Rex. Oh my God. Wasp or wolf? Nope, T-Rex. Every time. I just realized something, PJ. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but really That's quick, fine. I just want to point this out before I forget. You're basically a Beast Wars Transformer. I'm looking oh. at these. These are all, like, most of these are like, yeah, this, I had that toy as a Beast Wars Transformer growing up. Yeah, no, like, legit, you have uh, the Wasp, which was, oh, God, Waspinator. his name. Wasp. How can I forget Waspinator was the Wasp? Who was basically uh, Starscream. <laughs> Yes. Well, see, I always, I, my theory was that Starscream was Dinobot. No, it, it's, uh, it was um, Waspinator because what's cool was Waspinator soul in the cartoon went into Starscream's body at one point. Oh, because there was Beast Wars 2 when they went, returned to Cybertron and then they became no, like it, it weird happened in the first animals. series. Did it? Beast well, Wars was a weird Transformers cartoon. I'm just going to say it, that. It was. It was very good, but it was very weird. Um, oh, yeah, Tyrannosaurus. Posted, where Megalodon? I mean, you you could do it. So wait, you could do a whole Beast Wars campaign. That's yes. very psyche. You could absolutely do a whole one. We need to do a one shot like that now. Oh my god, I'm going to have to do that. Uh, also, I know I already uh, said it in the text, but I want to say it verbally. It's also amazing to see uh, friends of the show, Mr. Mihara, and Reap Psyche, and Maynard, and Grebo Lightbrush. Mm -hmm. Lightbrush. It's great to see you guys in the chat. Um, hello. Uh, without further ado, I'm still blown away by the were Tyrannosaurus. This, this, this is the type of animal tied to your heritage and is known as your inherent animal. You gain the beast and beastkin traits. That could be interesting. In addition to the traits from your ancestry, you gain the change shape ability. You can choose from beastkin feats and feats from your ancestry whenever you gain an ancestry feat. The change shape ability, one action from this heritage. Concentrate polymorph primal and transmutation traits. You change into a humanoid or hybrid shape. Each shape has a, has a specific 
persistent appearance, and most beasts can remain in their hybrid shapes by default. In hybrid shape, you appear as a mix between your ancestry and your inherent animal, T-Rex. In a hybrid shape, you gain jaws, unarmed strike, resembling the feature of your inherent animal, uh, fangs for bats, beaks for eagles, mandibles for wasps, and so on. Your jaws deal 1d4 piercing damage. They are agile finesse and unarmed traits, and they're in the brawling weapon group. In your humanoid shape, you retain the appearance of your original ancestry. So now you have such amazing fun opportunities to create whatever OC you want. Jeez. You could have an elven eagle beastkin. You could have an orcish bat beastkin. You so many combinations. PJ, I just also realized something else other than Beast Wars. This is also kind of like the, it's kind of like the Mortal Kombat animality fatalities. Yes, the animalities. Yeah, I, animalities. Uh... Like Luke, remember Luke Kane transformed into a dragon. He, they even did that in, I think, the second movie. Yeah, and he's and he's just oh god, he signposted it so terribly. That's my animality. Oh, good, shut up. Oh, the writing. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I'm having I'm having horrible childhood flashbacks. But the first movie was dope. Yeah, it was great. I love the first movie. Oh, we're so good. Yeah, I, I'm was... gonna say, are you looking forward to the next, uh, the upcoming Mortal Kombat movie? I gotta admit, I'm so stoked for a rated R movie with high budget fight scenes. Very like it. It looks like they're trying to make Final, not Final. Good lord, it looks like they're trying to make Mortal Kombat 11 into a movie, mm -hmm. and that that's the best way to go there. The one thing I'm not excited about is that the movie is not following Liu Kang. It's yeah. following Cody Young, some, some Mary Sue vehicle for us. I'm yeah. like, we don't need this guy. Just give us Liu Kang. Give us Kung Lao. Give us Johnny Cage. Yeah. That, that's one of the main things that I'm like, I'm disappointed. I think I'm one of the few people who are disappointed in see, hearing that Johnny Cage is not going to be in the next Mortal Kombat movie. Which is like, he's, I get it. I get it. It's a large a cast, huge. but he is a central character cast. Yeah, I mean, he's he and Sonya Blade's stories are so intertwined, yeah. and you kind of need both of them to make Cassie Cage happen. So yeah, like anyway, you, I I love the intros in like the newest Mortal Kombat with uh, Cassie Cage. Like, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> uh I love I love the audio. I love the way uh, that studios does that. Yeah. But anyway, um, um, let's move on to the feats. Sure, sure. Do you want me to take on the first one? Absolutely. All right. Uh, the first feat is a level one feat called Animal Senses. You gain one of the following senses available to your inherent animal. Dark vision, low light vision, or sense. In precise, 30 feet. You must have low light vision before you can gain dark vision with this feat. If your inherent animal doesn't typically have a specific type of sense, you can't gain that sense with this feat. You, also, uh, special, you can gain this feat multiple times, choosing a different sense each time. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna look back really quick, because does Beast can get low level? Uh, low, low, low light? They don't get low light vision. Huh. No, because that ability is based off your ancestry, not your heritage. Oh, so yeah. The, the interesting, yeah, so the interesting thing with this is that this is an upgrade to whatever you already have. Yeah. I guess you have um, to take low light here if you're like a human. Then you can upgrade it to dark vision. Yeah. It, it's a weird vibe. Like, it's great if you already have a good sense, naturally. If you're an elf, you already have dark vision, right? Or low light vision, I forgot, one of the two. You can just bump it up to the next spot. And if you are a do a, uh, an orc, which I'm sure has dark vision, mm -hmm. then you can give yourself scent in precise 30 feet as well. Yeah. Oh, cool. uh Oh, Malice1974 posted halfling T-Rex and then re replied, small person with even smaller arms. Oh, Malice, great to see you in the chat, and I absolutely love that. Just a just a little halfling getting really angry and then turning to a halfling-sized T-Rex and their arms shrink, and they go, I have a big head and little arms, and I'm starting to wonder if this plan was not well thought out. <laughs> I mean, at that point... <laughs> You're you're less of a T Rex. You're more of a Velociraptor, or uh, one of those uh, the dinosaur that uh, the chickens evolved from, which I think was a Velociraptor. Uh, 
there, there's a very good argument for that because I know that we always thought they had skins like lizards, but most research now kind of mm -hmm. shows that they actually had fur and feathers to keep mm -hmm. warm. Um, but who knows? Yeah. Uh, I wasn't alive back then, so I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. You want to jump to uh, Critter Shape? Absolutely. Oh, this is... I don't know, but I'm calling it now. This is going to have fun roleplay potential. Mm -hmm. Once per hour, <clears throat> you can use Change Shape to enter a Critter Shape. While in Critter Shape, you gain the effect of a first-level pest form, except you can only transform into an animal matching your inherent animal. That is so dangerous with T-Rex heritage. Yeah, I was going to say, wait, wait. So if you have a dinosaur form and... People are saying they're some of them are like if chickens evolved from them. You could turn into a chicken. You could turn into a chicken. That would be a lot more balanced than turning into a T Rex, which is not a first level pest form, I don't think. I um, um, also want to say, uh, so yeah, this also this allows you to be turned into that were crab form, the were crab, skittering along the beach. That's very true. Now, thankfully, pest form is not limited by a CR. Thankfully, mm -hmm. instead, pest form is just a list of stats. AC is 15 plus level. Ignore armor checks. The speed. Speed is 10 feet, which kind of sucks. Weakness, 5 to physical damage, so you're easily killed. Easily. You have low light and imprecise, 30 feet. Acrobats and stealth modifiers are plus 10, unless your modifier is higher, but athletics take a minus 4. At heightened, you get more stats. So, in a way you can still get a critter T-Rex. But I don't know if it's worth it, you know, if you crunch the numbers. But yeah, let's go back to the ability. You're, you're like, you're literally, you literally turn into a miniature. You, that you, you can you put on a in, table. <laughs> yeah, you just turn into, you basically turn into like a comp, a comp, a comp, comp, sognath, comp, sognathus? Comp, sognathus, there it is. Um, you can remain in critter shape for up to 10 minutes after which you transform back into your hybrid shape and can't enter your critter shape again for one hour. You can mm -hmm. instead use chain shape to return to a humanoid or hybrid shape uh, during critter shape. If your inherent animal is normally larger than tiny, you transform into a smaller, younger version of the animal, such as a tiny bear cub. Aww. Oh, that's cute. Uh, if your inherent animal has a fly speed, you can turn, <clears throat> you can turn into that animal, but you, still, but you still don't gain a fly speed. You know what? I, I'm gonna make a rule on my table. If you're a were dinosaur, your critter form is a is a chicken. <laughs> it's a chicken. I think I think it's definitely a fun choice. Uh, Mal says it explains for large critters. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a height change there. So like if you if you take the T Rex versus um, shape, thinking that you're gonna become a massive T Rex whenever you want to. I just also just reconsider. realized this. This is basically also kind of like the. The first tier form of a Pokemon. Mm, mm hmm Like, you ch instead of turning into, like, a Charizard, you turn into a Charmander. I love that. Honestly, though, it I is. can't be mad. I'm still, I'm still like, a five-foot or three-foot-tall lizard that's a living flamethrower. What's wrong with that? You're just cuter. <laughs> love me. I'm adorable, and I'm a flamethrower with personality. All right, uh, moving on uh, to the next one we have is called Quick Shape. It's a level one feat, and it's a free action. Uh, the trigger is you roll initiative. Your instincts kick in, and you take on an aggressive stance. You use change shape to enter your hybrid form or new form granted by a beast can feat. Okay, I have a little story attached to this one. Oh, yeah. One time I was in Long Beach, like 3 a.m. in the morning, leaving my friend's place, and I just see, I see some raccoons walking across the street. I look at them, they turn to look at me, and one of them just stands up and just like, does a come at me bro, like, gesture. <laughs> oh no. This is what, that's what I'm imagining quick shape is now. It's like a raccoon standing up on his hind legs go, come at me bro, come at me, come at me man. <laughs> I mean, kudos to you. You you intimidated a raccoon with your with your mere presence. That was him, you know, sizing up. Oh my god, I love that this is a free action to transform um, your shape because I can imagine the challenge of let's say you're you're in critter or you're in some other form, and a fight starts, and maybe you as a player was trying to do something else, and you are definitely being dragged into this fight. 
And now this allows you to poof into the form you need to actually do this fight properly. As you're being dragged by your feet by someone, you just go, come at me, bro. Come at me as you're transforming. <laughs> you're transforming. Everyone's like, it's like, no, no, Reginald, let me go. He's eating my garbage. No. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Level five or rank for, yeah, feet five um, feats. Animalistic resistance. Your animalistic connections help you resist natural afflictions. You get a plus two circumstance bonus to saves to resist disease and poisons. It's nice. It's a permanent bonus to two different things. Not bad. Mm -hmm. uh, next one is called, uh, that's in the book. I, I want to point out there's another one previously, but it's not actually in this book. We're, mm -hmm. I believe we're just going through what's in this book, right? Yes, sir. Uh, it's called Greater Animal Senses. It's a level five feat. Your senses advance to match those of your animal aspect. You gain one of the following senses available to your inherent creature animal. Echolocation, imprecise, 30 feet or th uh, thermo uh, sense. Uh, tremor sense. Tremor, so basically... tremor, tremor sense. Tremor sense, imprecise, yeah. 30 feet. And if your inherent animal doesn't typically have a specific type of sense, you can't gain the sense of this feat. And also special, you can select this feat multiple times, either choosing a different sense or improving an imprecise sense granted by this feat to a precise sense. Um, tremor sense, I, I had a little trouble because also something else just popped in my head. Every time I think tremor sense, I think of the tremor creatures from the movie Tremors Yeah. with Kevin Bacon and everything. I mean, you're not entirely wrong. If you look at this ability, assuming your animal form, and you, the one thing I don't like about this is that because they don't spec out specific animal form choices, this is now up to the GM to allow you to get these benefits of this feat, as opposed to you just taking it and, and going on with your life. Yeah. yeah. But uh, what's cool is, posted mm -hmm. graboid, graboids. Graboids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what I was going to say really fast is that this feat mm. basically makes you daredevil or tough. Mm. Um, which, if you think about it, <clears throat> as far as combat is concerned, is insane. I mean, Toph did learn her bending from the mole, the giant moles in the Earth Nation. Yeah, and you could absolutely have a um, a beastkin of a mole. You get you get the claws, the jaws. You get the tremor sense. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, also, Malice nineteen seventy four says. So, does your gear merge with your transformation, or does it Hulk out? The trait does have the polymorph feature so i believe the gear from that trait uh morphs with you uh, i i would still say talk with your gm about it first just to make sure you're all on the same page it is a rare uh it is a rare ancestry after all yeah and it could be something that regardless of the rules because the rules are guidelines mm -hmm. it, it could be something fun to play you know like when i turn into a moose i lose some of my rings or whatever mm -hmm. um also, really fast, oh. the, 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 the feat that we skipped was called Fey Influence. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen our previous Ancestry uh, guide, um, the Fey Influence is one that apparently a lot of these classes, or a lot of these Ancestries get. It basically allows you access to Primal Magic and to add Primal Magic to your spell book. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I also want to point out that uh, when you say you transform into a moose and you, maybe you lose some rings, I would disagree. Those rings are now on the tips of the ends of your uh, antlers. Whatever. Yeah, the your antlers are all blinged out. I love that. Maybe earrings. Well, yeah, earrings can still stay on. Yeah. All right. The, next up. Uh, I'm sorry. What's animals that? have ears. Most well, most animals have ears. True. I mean, frog would be kind of hard, but it would be kind of cool to see a wear. Well, it, it turns into a tongue ring. Oh my god. <laughs> Again, I think all that flavor would really have to go down with your GM. Um, right. Or you know, just make it up yourself. Yeah. Pack tactics, the other level nine feet. Mm -hmm. You have mastered how to hunt with your pack. If an enemy is within reach of you and at least two of your allies, that enemy is flat footed against you. So you don't have to be flanking. You don't have to be stealthing. Mm -hmm. You could just create flat footed statuses automatically. So long as you are within, within five feet of two of your allies. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, that's nasty. Um, I want. I, do, I kind of want to point out the next feat, though. Um, you, I think you skipped it. 
Oh, I thought we already covered uh, animal no, yeah, we magic. Did, yeah, we did greater animal senses. I missed yeah. animal magic. Go right ahead. So I'll do animal magic instead, which is a level nine feet. Your shape shifting grants you a magical connection to the animal world. You can cast animal messenger, calm emotions, animals only, and speak with animals as a second level prime primal innate spell once per day. These spells use your class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher. Yeah. I like the I like the speak with the animals because this gives me the, the Doctor Doolittle vibes. Yeah. Plus, it's fun because like now, you can so role play and do um, information research even if you're out in the wild. You don't mm -hmm. have to wait for a town. You can just talk to a squirrel and learn learn from the squirrel. But also, I want to point out most animals don't really care about all this other stuff. It's like, yeah, the squirrel only it's only kind of gives a shit like yeah. Those acorns over there, really tasty. Stay away from my hole. <laughs> you know, and I think, I think that interpretation is definitely up to the GM. Because, like, yeah. you've definitely seen moments in shows where the animal's like, I, I have, like, a passive understanding of what's going on around me. Um, and that leads to some fun moments where everyone does a double take and they're like, wait, what did you just say so offhandedly? Um, All right. Oh, God. Uh, do you want to take a dire form? I do. At... Feet level 13 for your ancestry. You get dire form. Your hybrid shape is now a hulking beast. Mal is talking about hulking mm -hmm. out. While you're in your hybrid shape, you gain the effects of enlarge. Mm -hmm. You could be a giant chicken or a giant this crab. Is, no, this is it. This isn't even when you're in critter form and you're the full animal. This is when you're in your normal form. When you're because like they said, your hybrid form is your normal form. Your human form is kind of your farce, and your critter shape is just something else you could do. You are naturally enlarged, which, if you're curious what that does, duration is five minutes, but I think in this case it's permanent because it doesn't say otherwise. Um, bolstered by magical power, the target grows to size large. Equipment grows with it, but returns to natural size if removed. You're now clumsy one. Oh no. Its reach is increased by five feet or ten if it started out as tiny, and it gains a plus two status bonus to melee damage. You just do ten uh, two more damage. Um, the spell has no effect on a large or larger creature. Hey, hold on. I'm still saying, where, oh where chicken or where crab, dude? <laughs> While you're in your hybrid shape, you gain the effect of enlarge. So that's a, that's a crazy. So long as you're in your hybrid shape, you are always benefiting. Yeah. From the enlarged spell. Yeah. That is bananas. Uh, Reap Psyche so posted, so wait, large halfling? We call that a half-elf. <laughs> a large halfling? We call that a fling. We call that a... Technically, a halfling is a, 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 a We call that like, Bob. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Bob, the full halfling. The full halfling? That's right. I'm the size of two halflings. <laughs> Are you, aren't you? you just the size of a person? Shut up. Uh, <laughs> or... or I'm a halflings. I'm, a, I'm three halflings in a trench coat, buddy. Oh my god, dire form is insane. I mean, just imagine. Now, I want to talk about this when we're done with this. It'll be fast, but like different builds, different class builds you can use with this ancestry. There's a list of recommended in, in the description, but why take recommendations when we can, you know, do our own thing? But just, just a dire form barbarian entering a rage? With a high strength and a magical weapon? What? I just realized something also. This would be also a really cool roleplay to, uh, tool. Like, uh, yeah, say a halfling has this form, uses it all the time, so stays in it, and refers to himself as a half-elf. And, yeah, and doesn't reveal that he's actually a halfling. There, there's some potential there. I need to check to see if in this edition halflings have pointed ears. But yeah, you could absolutely do that. Um, or a really also... super tall, like, oh, a kobold saying that they're a half dragon or something. Oh, dead. That I like because you can tell they're like trying to get back at the level where kobolds were like yeah. neck and neck with their dragon gods and things like that. Or even goblins saying, no, I'm not a goblin. I'm a ha hobgoblin. Yeah. Or orcs are just like, yeah. I'm a bigger orc. Let's go. I'm a bork. I'm a bork, 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 bork. Uh, God, why don't you take gift of the moon? 
<laughs> oh man, this this class is so memeable. It is, but it's actually. Re- oh no, you could also do a wolf and just be a goofy boy, and then you'd be Moon Moon. Oh no, I gotta play Moon Moon now. Oh. Uh, Reap Psyche in chat posted. Wait, do they benefit from enlarge or are they large? Meaning, do they go up a size class or do they go from whatever they are straight to large? Great question, Reap Psyche. Um, yeah, in the description on the website, it does say they benefit from the spell enlarge, just like Malice put in there. Mm-hmm. So um, they they basically benefit from the spell, and they can get up to. Hold on, actually, let me let me confirm we'll do one this. size they, up. Well, that's why I want to confirm really fast. Uh, bu- 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 bu. At the target size, it grows to large. Um, and if they were already tiny and now they're growing to large, they get a plus 10 feet of range to their hit instead of just 5 to their range to hit um, or their reach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, so a, a goblin could turn, into, could turn to a large size and just say they're a full orc. In, if, they, if they wanted to, I think... Just because you're a bigger goblin doesn't mean you're going to stop looking like a goblin. You're just going to be a very big goblin. You know what I mean? You can always say, like, yeah, um, my great, 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 great uncle on my mom's side was a goblin. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, here's my question. Because this spell can be heightened, but the ability is basically an innate spell, or a spell-like yeah. ability, if you will, from Pathfinder 1. So I'm wondering... Uh, As you level up, does the spell get heightened? Uh, Malice1974 in chat posted, the fourth level version turns you huge. Yeah, that, that's why I'm asking. Heightened fourth gives you a size of huge. The bonus damage is plus four. Your reach is increased to 10 or 15 feet if you're tiny. And then sixth level, you can choose <laughs> a huge the- halfling. Sixth level, you can choose either the second or fourth level versions of the spell, but apply it to ten willing creatures. Okay, nope. Mm-mm. They, I can, yeah, they're not gonna let that heighten naturally. Oh my god. Anyway, let's move on to the next one called Gift of the Moon. Mm-hmm. It's a level thirteen feet. Excuse me. You can share your power with others but they can't escape the Were Creature's Curse as easily as you can. You can cast a 5th level Moon Frenzy as a primal innate spell once per day. At 15th level, you cast a 6th level Moon Frenzy instead. At 17th, you your 6th level Moon Frenzy grants its standard effects, except the temporary hit points increase to 15 and the silver weakness increases to 15. At 20th level, you cast a 10th level Moon Frenzy instead, and the spell uses your class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher. So, you're, you're, you're basically sharing your beastkin ability with other people in your party, or yeah, enemies. I, <laughs> yeah, and I think that language there kind of explains whether or not the enlarge spell does heighten. I don't mm-hmm. think it does because because the spell like ability they're they're telling you at these levels this would be heightened. Otherwise it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Which still being a large sized creature with a five foot reach increase and a plus two damage passively all the time is really good. Yeah. Do you want to take on uh, animal shape? Uh before we before we okay. do that I'd like to kind of look more into moon frenzy if people aren't familiar with moon <laughs> frenzy since this is basically what the ability lets you do. A feral aspect overcomes a target, making him tough and savage. That target gains five temporary hit points, plus a 10-foot status bonus to their speeds, and a weakness of five to silver. Um, they also grow vicious fangs and claws, which are unarmed attacks. The fangs deal 2d8 piercing damage, claws deal 2d6 slashing, and they have agile and finesse. The target uses their highest weapon or unarmed attack proficiency with these attacks. Um, on a critical hit, the creature's duck uh, struck takes 1d4 persistent bleed damage, which is awesome. Um, targets can't use concentrate actions unless these actions have the rage trait. Skip ahead, skip ahead. Yeah, and everything else is pretty much as described. Yeah. Uh, temporary HP goes up to 10, but you, you have 10 weakness to silver. Um, oh, but the damage dealt by the attacks is now 3d8 instead of 2d8. And same with the 10th level, it's now 4d8 instead of 2d8. 
Uh, okay, so sorry, but I just wanted to put that out there because Gift of the Moon sounds like if you can share that with the whole teammate, a whole team, that, that's pretty good buff spell. Yeah, you, you, you basically have your own pack. Mm hmm. They also had any weapon specializations to damage. Thank you, Malice. Yeah, that, that's also really nifty, especially if a fighter in the party or a monk in the party. All right. Sorry for <clears throat> taking all the air. Uh, let's do animal shape. This is your 17th level feet. You have full control over your shape and can transform into your inherent animal. You can use change shape to enter an animal shape. When you gain this feat, choose either um, aerial, aerial form, animal form, or dinosaur form. After choosing a form, you can't change that form. While in the Beast animal wars. shape, <laughs> while in the animal shape, you gain the effect of a fifth level casting of your uh, of your chosen form spell. Except you always transform into an animal matching your inherent animal, and you can use your humanoid form's AC if it's higher than what the animal form grants. So now you're the world's toughest chicken. If your inherent animal isn't among the animals listed in the form, you default the statistics and abilities of the bird battle form, cat battle form, or Dionicus or Di Dinonychus battle form for aerial form. Animal form and dinosaur form, respectively. Do you have discretion? There's a lot of fluff mm -hmm. here. Uh, you instead default to a different form that is closest to your inherent animal. You can remain in animal shape indefinitely and can use chain shape to return to your hu humanoid or hybrid shape at any time. If you have critter shape, uh, you can choose to gain the effects of a fourth level pest form, which you can remain in critter shape indefinitely and can retain your critter shape at any time after leaving the shape as you can with animal shape. That's a lot. But basically what it comes down to is that you're now the most powerful burb. You're the most violent of crab. Also, honestly, this is just... You're a druid. You're a shape-shifting druid without being a druid. <laughs> yeah. And, and one of the recommended uh, classes for this ancestry is druid. I think it's like druid, barbarian, and uh, a few others. So if you really want to go down that right, you absolutely can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I actually think, uh, us, or you have the best of both worlds at that point. Like, you could be a caster druid as a beastkin druid, be a caster druid, but also have, through uh, this uh, feet chain, the ability to transform. Yeah. And I think it also should be said, just for the sake of, like, what cool crap you can do with this, mm -hmm. these are just added bonuses. If you are a wizard or a sorcerer or an oracle or a witch, and maybe you're like, I'm squishy and I lack melee options, you don't have to blow any of your spells and now suddenly becoming a dire bear that can just wreck people's faces, especially investing a lot into that. If you are a monk, you can now become a werewolf monk who can flurry of blows with these massive claws, uh, cause especially considering they are considered, uh, I think, unarmed brawling weapons. So... Go wild. Hey, PJ, I want to yeah. be a beastkin barbarian luchador with a chicken form and be called El Diablo Pollo. Oh, yeah. The chicken devil has returned. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. Oh, my God. The, the, the buffalo leg drop. The buffalo. The buffalo wing drop. The buffalo. I know I know. it's, it's, it's uh, uh, copyright, so we can't use it, but you could have like a... Uh, a rear naked chokehold called the wild wings like ah, i mean wild there wings. is a chokehold called the chicken wing yeah it's um it's a half nelson isn't it yeah yeah uh so good that's... old chicken wings anyway um uh, now we are at the capstone uh feet here at with a level 17 feet called animal swiftness you move like an animal your speed increases by five feet in addition, you gain one of the following speeds available to your inherent animal. Climb, fly, or swim. You gain the speed only while in your hybrid shape. The new movement is as fast as your standard speed. For example, if you have a 30-foot uh, speed, you, gain, you can gain a 30-foot climb speed. If your inherent animal doesn't typically have a specific type of speed, you can't gain it with this speed. I mean, with this feat. If your inherent animal doesn't typically have a climb, fly, or swim speed, your speed increases by 10 feet instead. Eh, it's not too bad. It, 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 I can see it working well with uh, the speediness of a monk. 
like it's it's interesting because depending on what your normal ancestor is um you have a very interesting potential here to just be a speed demon like if yeah. you take i think it's an elf maybe yeah you take the, i think the elf has like 30 feet uh and you make them like a cheetah a beastkin mm -hmm. um and a monk now you're you're basically working around being a tabaxi monk but you just you just got so much speed yeah uh in chat reap psyche posted you literally just described the main character of the game guacamelee at yeah i actually i played some of that game i still need to get back to it but it is a really super super fun game guacamelee i heard weird things and there's two of them now right yeah. guacamelee one and two yeah i uh, want to guacamelee get them one and guacamelee two turbo Two turbo, uh, pulling a street fighter and just going right to turbo. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, I think that's awesome. Um, I guess my question is like, so back and forth, because the speed looks nice, but I think the Capstone 17 before that um, called Animal Shape mm -hmm. has just got to be. It's better. It's better. It, it's so delicious. So like, much better playing into the animal feats here it would be really tough for me to build this ancestry with or this heritage with another ancestry and not just go full beastkin it, it's too yeah. fun it's too good i mean the only time i would take uh the other uh capstone would be if i was specifically making a character built on just increasing uh speed alone that's the main crux of the character is could, speed, yeah. speed, speed. Like Cheetor I, from uh, Beast Wars. Exactly. Well, like I was saying, you get like an elven uh, heritage or uh, ancestry, which I think has 30 uh, speed, which is some of the best speed right now. Yeah. And this guy, which could like by level 20, uh, have another plus 10 and yeah. maybe even through other feats, more, more, more And speed. on top of that with a monk who whose speed just goes up and up. So you're, you're basically, you're working on making fantasy flash. Yeah. Oh, God. Hi, I'm Harry Allen. I'm the most wildest man alive. When I run, uh, animals are scared of me. Yeah, um, just, just make sure you don't uh, break the time 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 stream again. <laughs> damn it, Barry. Uh, Get off the so, cosmic treadmill. Uh, I, I think the last time I watched that show was season... Oh, God, the, the one with the thinker in it. The, the tinkerer, the yeah. thinker. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Smart yeah. Uh, I kind of took a break. I still need to catch up on it. I stopped watching near the end of a Crisis. Yeah, I really, I really wanted to watch that, but I just got so burnt out. Yeah. Tw like Twenty-four hours of television is not easy to sit through. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Reap Psyche posted something. Uh, oh, yeah, I yeah, wonder yeah. if there's a way to make that five E sound barrier breaking Tabaxi monk speed build in Pathfinder Two E. I'm pretty sure we could figure a way out, <laughs> figure that I think, out. I think there is. I think if we take the elf with the beastkin and pump up that speed that way, take a few feeds for more mobility, and maybe go monk, because I need to yeah. double check, because I think monk has feeds that also yeah. increase their speed. Yeah, they do, they do. Yeah, you could easily get, um, I think, about the same. Yeah. Ah, there's Which one is faster, caveat. Which faster, an elf or a tabaxi? I, I want to say a tabaxi is actually faster than, than an elf. Tabaxi is faster, and there's only one reason for that, um, because their speed, their natural speed, is the same. But the thing is, is that tabaxis can um, double their speed using a bonus action, I believe, as, mm. as a natural racial ability, so they just take off. And there are some, like, fighter and barbarian abilities where you get to move twice and attack once as part of a two-action choice. Yeah. But it's not quite the same. It's not pure speed. The pure speed of a monk. It's not. Yeah, it's not quite the same economically speaking. Uh, so I don't. I think it could work, but it would work so differently that I have to make you wonder if it's worth it. You know what I mean? I mean, we we do have a build uh, segment today. I mean, that's something we could work on. <laughs> we could. Um, I I know that we talked about uh, last time doing the light eaters. If we want to put the light eaters back a bit. We could definitely well, build the fastest character alive. That's up, to, that's up to the chat. We'll decide yeah. that challenge when we get there. Anyway, uh, let's move on to our next ancestry in the in the, Lost, the Pathfinder Lost Omens Ancestry Guide. Yes. 
if you remember during the Night Witches of New Jack City one shot that we did for charity on Saturday, we had two players who were sisters that played uh, Strixes, as I like to affectionately call them, um, the Strix sisters. Uh, so now we want to talk more about that because it was a very cool thing, and e even they were getting their hands on it and play with it. So let's look mm -hmm. deeper into what the Strix is mm -hmm. and what we can do with it. Oh, um, really quick, um, Recycy and Ooh, one second. Sorry, I have really big thumbs and presses buttons. Um, Recycy posted. I, I kind of like this idea. Speed eaters. Hmm. See, now what's interesting about that is, how do you, what's your concept? Like, are you making everything slow around you? Are you making someone who's really good at, like, ingesting potions as, like, a free action? Like, what I mean, doing? it's basically based on the Flash comics. There is a group that's based around a villain called Salvatore who formed a cult around speed and stealing speed. Yeah, the, um... Oh, I forgot the name of their cult. But yes, uh, Savita. Savita was based off the um, Indian, the Hindu god of movement. Yeah. And I believe the idea was that he was killing speedsters and collecting their power so he could basically, like, through his cultish ritual, just steal the speed force for himself. Yeah, be the god of speed, basically. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, do you want to start reading uh, the intro of this one? I'll do, the, I'll do the opposite, do the crunchy bit this time. Sure. Known as Itari in their own language, Strix are reclusive avian humanoids devoted to their homelands and their tribes. They defend their precious communities with bro broad wingspans and razor talons. Strix value ferocity, vengeance, and devotion above all else. Their dark, formidable wingspans and long history of taking revenge for their fallen family members have painted them as winged devils in the eyes of neighboring human populations. In contradiction to their misunderstood nature, Strix boast a, Strix boast a spiritual, artistic, and compassionate culture that is rarely seen outside their roosts. As Strix populations begin to resurge and spread beyond the mountains region, known as the Devil's Perch, their tribes now speckle the landscape of Cheliacs and surrounding nations. Soaring over mountains, forests, and beaches, Strix are always brought home by the deep connection they share with their kinfolk. If you want a character who is loyal, yet enigmatic, fierce, yet artistic, and who yearns to soar above the world, you should play a Strix. I, I like that they have, like, bird feet. Yeah, they legit have bird talon feet. Um... I don't know where it says this, but during the Night Witches uh, show, the Strix sisters revealed that Strix's eyes don't move. They're always kind of facing forward. So when they look at something, much like a bird would, they have to move their head to look at it. Like an owl. And yeah, and it's very unnerving to be like, how's it going, Bob? And Bob's like, how's it going, you know, duck? Uh, duck? I, duck. I, I, I like that bit of duck. character uh, role play uh, thing. Yeah. All right. It's uh, definitely fun. All right, now let's move on to the crunchy crouton mechanics. Uh, Strix, they have a hit points of eight, size of medium, speed of twenty-five, and their ability boost is dexterity and one of their choosing. Uh, they have languages of common Strix and um, additional, according to uh, intelligence modifier, which could be anything from uh, draconic, giant, gnome, infernal, what have you. They also have low light vision, so yeah, they can see in a semi-dark, and the highlight is they have wings. All Strix possess powerful wings, while not all Strix focus on honing their flying skills. A strong flap of their wings allows Strix to travel longer distances when jumping. When leaping horizontally, you move an additional 5 feet. You don't automatically fail on your checks to high jump or low jump if you don't stride at least 10 feet first. In addition, when you make a high jump, a long jump, you could jump a distance up to 10 feet further than your athletic check result, though still with uh, the normal maximum of your speed. Hey PJ, I'm kind of curious. This is just me and kind of a bi biology point of view. Do you think a Strix would have hollow bones like a bird that would allow them to fly and do all that kind of stuff? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, 
I mean, well, judging by some of the pictures, they definitely have dense muscle mass and muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say because, like, yeah, muscle mass can absolutely compensate for hollow bones. Yeah. But then if your muscle's too dense, you could break your own bones. Yeah, because I, I'm basically taking this idea from how they designed Angel, a.k.a. Archangel from X-Men. Yeah. He has hollow bones. That's how he's able to fly. Yeah, which, which perplexes the hell out of me because I don't know how that boy is not getting injured left and right. Yeah. Um, especially with some of the landings he pulls. So what I'm thinking is, because this isn't, this isn't true flight, mm -hmm. so really what it comes down to is that they are using their wings for a powerful draft that increases their natural jump speed or allows them to compensate for lack of momentum, which would make sense, biologically speaking. So kind of like a hang glider, kind of, right? Or a parachute. Uh... Sort of. It's more like, you know how sometimes uh, jumping off the flat and then jumping off a trampoline gives you two vastly different uh, mm -hmm. jumps? I've, I feel like this is more like jumping with a trampoline because your okay. wings are kind of, you know, uh, adding more to your vertical right. and your horizontal leap. All right. Well, let's now move on to the heritages. Do you want to take the first one with Night Glider? Yes. You are a dedicated nocturnal avian. Keep watching and predating in the most lightness environments. You gain dark vision. So like an owl. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. All right. The next one is Predator Strix. You come from a line of Strix with exceptionally broad wings and lengthy talons. You gain a talon melee unarm attack that deals 1d4 slashing damage. Your talon attack is in the brawling group and has the agile finesse, and unarmed tra uh, traits. So a bird of prey, which is kind of cool. If yeah. you have this with as a monk or the martial artist, what do you call it? The martial artist uh, archetype. I can definitely see that with the martial arts archetype. Monk is a hard maybe because monks get unarmed attacks that do 1d6. So barbarian then? Barbarian would be kind of fun, especially if you go with, like, Dragon Instinct. So now your mm. your bird claws are becoming more draconic. Ooh, ooh. Swashbuckler. That could be a lot of fun, especially if your weapon of choice is your claws. Yeah, and also your bird form is either a peacock. <laughs> I mean... A your, peacock swashbuckler. Your, your bird form doesn't really change, but I could... Uh, I mean, as long as you can fly, well, as long as you have wings... I, I that think would they be have funny. wings. They have wings. They, they have a display. It's more like a mantle or something. But yeah, they wing, have they have, they have wing ish. It's not like they're really gonna fly. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're the, the type of bird that doesn't really fly. They just they glide like you said before. They kind of like they, yeah. that gliding thing. Yeah. No, and that could. I mean, that would definitely be funny to have a Strix uh, peacock swashbuckler and be like, "Hello, my name is Nigo Montoyo Fufuloru." I don't know. Um, scavenge. Next heritage, scavenger Strix. Your ancestors originated from a land where food was scarce and threats were many. You are trained in survival. You gain the forage or skill feat as a bonus feat. Your thoroughness when gathering food provides you a plus one bonus to survival checks to subsist. A vulture. You're basically yeah. a badass vulture. Either a, wiz oh, a wizard necromancer vulture or a uh, witch. Ooh. A witch scavenger Strix. I could see that. I, I also really love this flavor for a ranger, you know, because it's like you are the survivor. You go out for long periods of time in mm -hmm. absolute destitute wastelands, and you know how to hunt and survive and track mm -hmm. from the sky and the ground. It's a, I think that could also yeah. be a lot of fun. Oh, uh, Reap Psyche in chat posted uh, Sky Pirate Time and also tells us that uh, peacocks can fly, but not far or well. And then Malice 1974 posted Strix Spellcaster. Come at me, bro, moments. <laughs> Rip Psyche asks, what ancestry was our necro cat lady? Great question. I believe the, the necromancer um, who was also an archaeologist was a Tengu. Yeah. Uh, her name was Carrion. Basically, well, Carrie Eon. So like, like a Carrion bird. I mean, if we want, we can now change her to a Strix now that we have Strix. <laughs> We could, we could. Um, but uh, anyway, we got uh, the cat lady. But yeah, our next uh, heritage here is called Shoreline Strix. You're the you're the you're the descendant of Strix who traveled the 
travel to the coast. Your feathers are especially water repellent and sleekly angled for diving, allowing you to catch fish and other prey in the, sh in the shadows. Swallows. You are trained in athletics and you gain the underwater marauder skill feat as a bonus skill feat. Now I'm thinking of those, God, what was that one cartoon, that animated movie with the seagulls? It's like, yep, yeah, yep, 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 yep. They just repeat oh. every last thing. Um, I want to say you're talking about Finding Nemo? Maybe, yeah. Like so I'm basically th seeing that now. Yeah, and I kind of like that. It's also great because, like, if you do fight underwater, which I don't know how often that's going to be, basically the shoreline strix is never flat footed underwater. Um, oh, Reap Psyche like just, just posted Duck Strix. You could be Dark Wing Duck or Scrooge McDuck. You could be an entire duck bird. When in trouble, you call DW because he's going to eat your face. Um, Songbird Strix. So this one I think I'm going to call now is probably a good one for Bard. You descend from a talented line of Strix storytellers. From the highest mountains, <clears throat> purest landscapes, where your lungs fill with glorious clean air, you trill, whistle, and croon sweet songs. While natural sounds make you predisposed to sing, voices make you predisposed to mimicry. You receive a plus one bonus on deception checks to impersonate a mimicked voice, where the sound of the voice is the only factor. If you are a master in deception, you get a plus two circumstance bonus instead. You also get a plus one bonus on performance checks to sing. If you're a master in performance, it's a plus two instead. Yeah, this is basically okay, the, so bar, yeah, the bar bird. Rogue. The bar bird. Yeah, and, and you could also kind of make it like um, like a rogue with, with, the, with the mimicry. Yeah, not bad. Or, okay, wait, wait. You can't do that. Because for a second, I say, "Hey, you could actually combine this hair." No, you can't. It's not a heritage. It's not a versatile heritage. I was about to say Tengu. No, that's, uh, that's not no. gonna work. But, maybe, uh, maybe with a feet. Eh. Anyway, though, um, let's move on to their feats, and I'm gonna kick things off with their first level feat called Nestling Fall. You. You trust the strength of your wings and can spread them to glide safely to the ground. As long as you can act, you take no damage from falling, no matter what distance you fall. So, this is essentially a flavored version of Catfall. It, it's, yeah, it goes a little beyond that, because I believe Catfall, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Rules is written, I believe Catfall um, takes the fall damage you would normally take, and then makes it either half as much or it subtracts a certain number of feet. This, what makes this completely broken in an OP is that so long as you are conscious when falling, you take zero fall damage from any height. Mm -hmm. So this is basically OP. really, actually, no, this is a better version of Catfall then. It's, it's superior and it's a level one feat. Yeah. Insane. Oh, uh, Reap Psyche and Chat posted uh, Liar Bird. They're absurd mimics. There's a guy on TikTok trying to teach teach them ACDC in the forest. That's amazing. I, I want to see a bird just like, like screaming, singing, like, like Angus Young. Mm -hmm. uh, Scream singing back in a... black. Oh my god. Um, Malice1974 says it's a natural feather fall. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but again, the fact that it's a passive ability at first level that makes you take no damage like Featherfall would m makes that kind of broken. Now, niche, but kind of broken. Like, if you're Chionibus just doing a vaulting jump over a 90-foot wall, no fear. You're going to take no damage. Yeah. You just have to be conscious. If you're, if you're like, yeah. passed out, you're, you're just going to still fall like a stone. Exactly. <laughs> Rip Psyche said, ha, feather fall, but I'm tis. Oh my god. All right, story. Us... Oh, that's all right. Yeah, I I'm I'm already owned it. You're a talented story weaver and can use your voice effectively. You are trained in performance. If you'd automatically become trained in performance, you instead become trained in a skill of your choice. You can also gain the impressive performance skill feat, plus one bonus when performing. For an audience of Strix. A um, little neat, but it's not too bad, especially if you're already like the singing Strix. Mm -hmm. You could really load up some bonuses for your performance check out the gate. Yeah, it's basically if you're a bard. Yeah. 
All right, next one we have up is Strix Defender. Level one feat. Your ancestral feud with humans give you a ex gives you experience dealing with vicious foes, and your vengeance knows no bound. You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to intimidation, perception, survival checks against humans, as well as on damage rolls against humans with weapons and unarmed attacks. However, your hatred of humans is immediately obvious, giving you a minus two circumstance penalty to diplomacy checks against them and usually starting their attitude one step worse towards you. Okay, this yeah. is actually, this is an interesting feat because, yeah, you, it makes you, like, it gives you the down, what's the word, the, the flaw of your... You're not cool with human human people. The the one thing to remember about this feat uh, is that this is not um, allowed in Pathfinder society. Uh, yeah. When you go to the archives of Nethsis, there's some interesting little symbols, and there's one where it's like a red X over. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it almost a looks like a, an yeah Coin. infinity symbol. Yeah, so you can use this at any of your home games. Mm -hmm. So your discretion, have a good time. But if you go to like a Pathfinder Society meetup, they're going to tell you, no, nah, you can't use that feat. Um, which kind of makes sense. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a little rough to play in like random group settings. Um, like, I hate all humans. You're Bender. Yeah. Kill all humans. Exactly. Like at a home game, you can kind of like mitigate that a little bit. But if you're meeting random strangers, there's a big chance this is going to cause some problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, Strix Lore is the next one. Take a wild guess. You get Lore Strix, as well mm -hmm. as some other things. Um, acrobatics and Nature. If you already have these, you can choose um, one more from your background, class, yada yada. Um, and you become trained in those skills. So there you go. Yeah. Ooh, I like this next one because this builds on the idea I had about the Peacock uh, Strix. The Feather Cloak. Level 5 feet. To blend in with the grounded and wingless, you fold your wings just so on your back, creating the illusion of a feather cloak. You gain a plus 2 circumstance bonus to deception checks to impersonate a version of yourself who is not a Strix, unless they look at your feet. Additionally, your folded wings help you obscure objects on your person, providing a plus 2 circumstance to your stealth checks to conceal an object. Like I said, this is really cool if you're that peacock Strix. Like, okay. Wings down, and then, whoosh. And also, I also kind of like the idea of the swashbuckler peacock using their feathers as like like that kind of parrying cape. So like they'll Dueling grab cape. their own and yeah, uh, dueling cape, parrying cape, um, different words in the mm -hmm. system, but the same idea. But you can have like you can have like your rapier behind your your um, parrying cape, dueling cape. And then do this big flurry and stab them, or you hide your blade and have a really cool fighting style, like yeah. a almost like a matador. Yeah. Uh, next up, okay, we're gonna skip fey influence. Once again, they get fey influence. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have primal spells, uh, if you're not a druid, pick it up. Fledgling flight. I believe this was something that the Strix sisters had in our show on Saturday. It's a mm -hmm. free action. You can fly through the air in short bursts and uh, at half your land speed. If you don't end your movement on solid ground, you fall at the end of your turn. So basically, you get a nice little burst. that lets you fly for half your speed, yeah. but you, you need to land, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. Or if you have that level one feet, which is basically superior cat fall. Yeah, the, the feather fall. So yeah. uh, it, from what it sounds like from the chat, it sounds like the spell feather fall functions exactly as that feat does. Which is still so good. Um, also, Malice, you get a hero point for making the Gargoyles reference to the fact that they glide and not fly. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, our next feat is a level 5 feat called Strix Vengeance. You dedicate yourself to destroying those who harm your kin. Until the end of your next turn, you deal additional 1d6 damage on strikes against the triggering enemy. The bonus increases to plus 2d6 if you if you use a striking weapon or unarm attack and plus 3d6 if you use a major striking weapon or unarm attack. And uh, really quickly, you can do this as a frequency of once per 10 minutes and the trigger is you or a Strix ally you can see are damaged by an enemy's critical hit. 
Oh, so just putting that out there, this is at the end of your next turn. Mm -hmm. That means you have a potential, and I use this word loosely because potential with negatives is very, very dicey. You have a potential to hit six times with plus one to plus three D six extra mm -hmm. damage. That's bonkers, and that's just a basic ability. Yeah, but I will say this though: it only probably will, ha will um, fire off maybe once per combat, since you can only do it once every ten minutes. Usually, that's how long usually like combat lasts in game. I think, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like as long as ten minutes has passed, you get it back again. Uh, I mean, that's just. <laughs> Token of own spit. That's the same time as it takes to refocus to get a focus mm -hmm. point back. So you could get a combat, you could refocus for 10 minutes, go on to the next fight. Um, and regardless, for that, for those two rounds, mind you, you're doing up to 3d6 bonus damage on every strike that you hit. Yeah. Still really, That's really insane. good. It's really good. Yeah. Um... All right, Strix Vengeance, my god. Uh, thrown Voice. You learn how to throw your voice through the winds, tricking others as to your location. You can cast Ventriloquism as a primal innate spell once per day. If you're a songbird, Strix, you can do this twice. Hmm. This is great for rogues. Oh my god. This is that Tengu feat, the Tengu ability, basically, right? Mm, yep, but you get to do it twice a day. Well, I don't know, because they have bonuses to mimicry. They don't really throw their void. I have to go back yeah. and check. It's been a while. Okay, it's it's a modified, lesser version of that Tengu ability. Yeah, and yeah. and it's interesting enough, because like, Strix Vengeance is very powerful for a rogue, mm -hmm. but Thrown Voice is very handy for a rogue. So yeah. I don't know which one would be the best choice. It, it depends on how, how you... The type of game it's used in. Uh, but yeah, anyway, um, we're moving on to uh, level 9 feet called Ferocious Gus, which is a 2 action um, ability, and you could do it once per 10 minutes, much like um, Strix Vengeance. With heavy wing beats, you whip up a Ferocious Gus and direct it at your opponents. This air gut blast has the effects of Gust of Wind with a DC equal to the DC, the class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher. So this is basically the Gust attack from Pokemon. I was thinking that you read my brain. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, you're basically like my wings. Flap, 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 flap. <laughs> like okay. I would honestly, like if you use it like in a place where there's like a lot of dust or like in a desert as a GM, I might even just give you some bonuses because you're whipping up all that dust and sand. Yeah, I mean, looking at the Gust of Wind spell that you're basically casting for free, mm -hmm. um, you're not really doing damage unless, of course, the target critically fails, then, mm -hmm. then they take damage. But everything else is just controlling and manipulating your environment. You could knock people back. You could, in theory, make some creative rolls to a, to a sandstorm by mm -hmm. Darut. You could have a great time doing whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, for those who's, who are wondering, the Gust of Wind is a level 1 spell, um, so, somatic and uh, verbal. The area is a 60-foot line, and the saving throw is fortitude, and duration is until the start of your next turn. A violent wind issues forth from your palm, blowing from the point where you are when you cast a spell to the line's opposite end. The wind extinguishes small, non-magical fires, disperses fog and mist, blows objects of light bulk or less around, and pushes larger objects. Large or smaller creatures in the area must attempt a forward to save. Large or smaller creatures that later move into the gust must attempt the save on entering. The critical success is the creature is unaffected. Success, the creature can't move against the wind. Failure, the creature is not prone. If it's, it was flying, suffers from the effects of critical failure instead. And critical failure is the creature is pushed 30 feet in the wind's direction, knock prone, and takes 2d6 bludgeoning damage. Yeah, and just like Reba Psyche was saying, wing buff it like what Dragon's Hat 3.5. Absolutely. Um, but you're getting this as a medium-sized creature, not a large or larger. Yeah, I mean, either way, it's also a very good utility spell, especially 
if you're dealing with uh, stuff like Cloud Kill or uh, or some kind of uh, uh, what's that? A spellcaster creates some sort of you know, fog or something that obscures your sight. Yeah, yeah, and and it's and it's got a lot of other fun stuff too. But mm -hmm. uh, that's you know up to you as the uh, player. So next up, we're now at the ninth level feats. If we haven't already gotten there, and yeah. we have juvenile flight for two actions. Mm -hmm. Frequency is once per day. You unfold your wings for travel and can keep them unfolded for ten minutes. So this basically is once per day. You get ten minutes of a fly speed equal to your land speed while your wings are unfurled. So that's not bad. It kind of sucks that it's once a day, but it's once a day, 10 minutes for free. If you have the fledgling flight um, feet from previously, I think level one, you gain a 10-foot uh, status bonus to your fly speed with juvenile flight. As normal, since your fly speed is derived from your land speed, this status bonus isn't cumulative for the status bonus to your land speed if you have one. So level nine, if you're going down the flight path, mm -hmm. the flight skill tree, which is kind of a cool idea, you now can get, um, I'm gonna say, somewhere between, for medium creatures, 35 to 40 fly speed for 10 minutes for free, once a day. Mm -hmm. uh, really quick, uh, in chat, Reef Psyche wanna know if that, that wind gust ability, could you use it as a down, could could you use it downward to propel yourself upward? I, I would I mean, say yeah. Yeah, it's it's not rules as written, but it's totally not out of question. Yeah. You know what I mean? And also, thank you to Pengu Chan for subscribing. And Pengu also, Chan, it's so good Pengu to Chan, see you in the chat. You could make a Pengu Chan character of yourself with the Strix, or the Beastkin. Uh, let's see, heritage, very versatile heritage. We talked about earlier as a Peng Penguin, Penguin Pengu. Well, I mean, we've, we've established in a game that Pengu Chan is a celestial bird person. Yeah. So it might be like an Asimar Strix. Like, like an avatar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, next up is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in pronouncing this, Rokokan Arts? Ooh, uh, I'm going to say it's Rokoan. Rokoan Arts, okay. Rokoan Arts. It's a level nine feet. Ancestral spirits have begun to bond themselves to you, granting you the powers and characteristics of a Rokoa. You could cast Speak with Animals and Status as primal innate spells once per day each. So you got access to some a couple of spells. And also yeah. speak with animals. It, there's if you're in the wilds or whatever, it's a it's a really good utility spell. I think it's actually very underutilized. Also, the, the, the spell status is really good. We had uh, Bev, um, who was playing the Elven Oracle, uh, cast this spell and all the other Night Witches on Saturday mm -hmm. in case, like, during the fight with Gus, they got separated. Um, uh, I was trying... Uh, oh, that, was a, that was fun. But this is a really great spell, especially if, like, you don't want to lose any teammates or you decide to, like, break up and go through an entire city. You can make sure you now have a ping on everyone so you know where they are. Like like a certain group of legends who <laughs> split the party on every almost every single episode. I love it. Yeah, just sitting there going like, "Hey guys, let's stick together and solve these problems." I'm gonna be at the bar. Yeah, I'm gonna go to the toy store. I'm gonna be at the beach. Like, hey. uh, let's see. Going into chat, I'm seeing two amazing penguins enter the chat. Penguin witch doctor and Pengu Chan. Hey. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what's what status for free? I believe so. Or at least a free, like, once-a-day cast, like an innate spell cast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's such a good way to tell the GM, if you pay me, where are my friends at? Yeah. yeah. All Wings. right. Uh, yeah. Next up is, I believe, yours with a wing step. That's right. It's a one-action feat at level nine. With a sharp flap of your wings, you stay light on your feet as you move. You can step twice. Not gonna lie, this is this allows you to step twice for every one action, all the time, no limitations. Mm -hmm. You want to be that like Barry Allen fastest monk alive? I think instead of Beast Kid, I think you go wing step with the uh, with with the, with the tricks. I got a question because uh, I know there's some abilities because I know uh, at least the playtest inventor. 
allows you to be quickened and have uh, multiple movements. Could you use multiple movements with this ability? So most quickened actions can only be used as a free action at the end of your three. Yeah. And usually they allow you to do either another another uh, stride mm -hmm. or another strike. So either move or attack. So in theory, you could. But the thing is that you cannot – I don't think you can apply this ability to the quickened action. Okay. Um, but but regardless, if you take a stride at any point, level nine or up, you can choose to just double your speed. That's bonkers. Yeah, like honestly, I'm really excited once we could uh, start playing on a map and we could like <laughs> utilize all these uh, movement abilities. I think a lot of our cast will be uh, retraining certain things once that happens. I I think I think that's more than valid, especially. Uh changing from theater of the mind to theater of the mats and you know they they deserve it um yeah. anyway um should we move on to the next feat yeah okay uh it's a level 13 feat called ancestors transformation you can communicate or commune with ancestor spirits to assume the form of an enormous primal strix you can cast the fifth level as aerial form as a primal innate spell once per day, but you take the form of a prim primordial strix using the statistics of a bird form. So big bird! So, you can be a big bird! <laughs> <laughs> sort of, yeah. So you're, you're choosing this primeval form, and the aerial form, um, for those of you that know, um, basically you harness your mastery of primal forces to shape your body into a medium flying animal battle form. In this case, it will be a bird. Um, while in this form, you gain the animal trait. You can dismiss the spell. Uh, your AC is 18 plus your level, ignoring armor checks, penalties, and speed reductions. You get 5 temp HP. You get low light vision, which for some accommodations of ancestries and, and uh, heritage may suck. But PJ, I don't know how this is going to work, but maybe cast enlarge with this ability on. And you could become, I want to see a kaiju, a kaiju <laughs> Tarax size big bird. Well... At maybe at higher levels, yeah, you could absolutely do that. Because uh, at level two, it's just, it bumps you to large. Yeah. Um, but let's see here. Uh, okay, so you get low light vision. One or more unarmed melee strikes to the battle form that you choose. Um, the damage bonus is plus five. This is great if you're not a melee character. Um, acrobatic modifier of plus 16, unless your own is higher. So it's great to have that fallback. You can also choose which one of these you're going to get. Since you're only turning into a bird, you're going to get a uh, speed of 10 feet for fly. No, I'm sorry. Speed of 10 feet, fly speed of 50. So you, you are heckin' fast in the air. You get a beak, which does 2d8 piercing. Talon, um, which is agile, which does 1d10 slashing. And both of those are a plus five. Um, so it's not bad, especially if you, are, if you are not a melee class. This basically allows you to, for free, evolve into a a pretty capable melee class fighter. Yeah. Uh, so the next one is mine, right? Yep. Fully flighted. All right. This is the very last ancestor um, ancestry feat for the Strix. Fully flighted, and this definitely requires you to go down the character build of fully investing in flight. Let's see what the payoff is. You gain the effects of juvenile flight... At all times, rather than just once per day for 10 minutes. This includes the status bonus to your speed if you have fledgling flight. You're always flying. You're always flying at least your, your land speed plus 10. And if you make a jump check, which why do you need to even make a jump check? If you want to, to flex on the, on the gnome... You just get another plus five or plus ten to the jump check. Like, that's... Oh, that's good. I, I like how they're using this bird. Yeah, it's a ba it's basically a bird. Um, ability to just... Hey, you're, you're just not... You're, you're not like uh, a certain other race and a certain other tabletop game system where you automatically, right out the gate, you can fly. This is a progression. I like how this is done here. It doesn't yeah. feel as OP as uh, certain people 
complain about cer- a certain race in a certain other yeah system. I, and i i i wholeheartedly agree because there that is a problem with that addition that flight flight is such an op bit of movement because it completely changes how the theater of combat is going to work mm-hmm. yeah you can still to take ranged spe- uh, spells but now you're going to be changing that trajectory and a bunch of other things that make it really yeah. unnecessary. Broken. You basically, because once you add flight as an option in combat and situation like that, you're adding another dimension, and that comes yeah. to a, that becomes a whole new type of game you're playing. Yeah, as well as puzzle solving. Like if you go to a dungeon and the big mo- and I had this, this experience. I was doing a Legend of Zelda homebrew campaign, mm-hmm. and we had someone playing a Rito. Um, the big mo- the big challenge was there's this open chasm and a door on the other end and you had to open the door in this massive chasm so the whole puzzle is how do you figure out how to cross this massive chasm get to the door well if you're a bird person who just flies all the time there's no puzzle you yeah. fly over you open the door you move on uh i want to put out in chat malice 1974 posted hawkman from flash gordon yep you're basically you could be brian blessed Gordon's alive? Gordon's alive! Oh my god, you could you could even be a barbarian Strix and be Hawkman and Hawk Girl. Yeah. Uh Penguin Chan posted, who needs flight when you are a celestial? That is very, very very valid. And very um true. Reap Psyche posted, Fire Emblem games made some good sense out of it that flying units had a weakness to ranged weapons, not making it so they can only be hit by it. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree, but I think it makes sense in a video game when you have like a checks and balance system uh, mm-hmm. that, that's like harshly built into the coding, kind of like how Pokemon works with yeah. their type advantages. It's different when it's in a role-playing game because like if they took, you know, if they have like a weakness five to range attacks, they just get eviscerated all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, like honestly, it's, it's basically all these... All these uh, mechanics in video games like that is basically rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, and a very yeah. smart rock, paper, scissors. But like rock, paper, scissors in tabletop uh, can, get, yeah. can get unbalanced quickly because it's all True. about uh, so many factors of balance. Yeah, um, really quickly, I also want to point out that uh, now I think about it, with a lot of these movement stuff with the Strix, you can further build on that to create a super speed flying thing with uh, Beast can Strix, Monk. Think about yeah, that. Yeah, you could. And that would actually be kind of a fun combination because you have a bird person who's got cheetah features. Yeah, or honestly, a bird person just went all in on the bird. Oh, actually, now you have... Because Beast can, as we covered... Um, are basically kind of like uh, 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 the legacy of lycanthropes, the legacy yeah. of zoanthropes. So you could really argue like you are the Strix that is the closest descendant of like these these rocks, these these yeah. god birds that your people came from. So now you have a bit more bird in you than most people. I would even say you, you literally have the bird head at that point. Now you're really looking around like this, yeah. look at people. Um, yeah, I think, and oh god, and with that one level nine ability, um, wind step. Yeah. I mean, you'd need juvenile flight to get fully flighted. That's just, mm-hmm. but my god, if you can get two ancestry feats, get wing step, dude. It, mm-hmm. oh, it, one no, action I, lets you walk twice. Yeah. My god. I'm just saying, if you're a beastkin strix and just go down your entire ancestry feats, you just take all the movement stuff. Just the movement stuff. Yeah. And and let's talk build for a second. Because, like, the beastkin is awesome, I feel like, for, yeah, if you want to really double down on the nature aspect. But sometimes hyper-niche focus removes some really awesome versatility. So, like, a beastkin could also be a good rogue, could be a good barbarian, could be a great fighter, could be a really great monk, especially with, like, you're striking so much. And you're always enlarged at level nine if you choose and now you're just doing more damage for more damage um so yeah but never mind like being a strix all the mobility which is insane all of the flying which can be useful for rogues which uh you could be a sorcerer and just get the heck out of the fight and cast a fireball like 
from point blank, get out of the range, fireball in their face. Oh, I just thought of this. A Strix with all that stuff and as a beastkin? You're not descended you're not descended from the rocks. You're descended from the frickin' Phoenix. Because there's literally a martial arts stance called Falling Embers where you it's based off of Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And and if you're a sorcerer instead, you can just get like an elemental bloodline and just have like the the elemental fire churning mm-hmm. inside of you. You could literally be descended from phoenixes as yeah. not only just like not only just an ancestry, but a class. And how dope would that be to play a mundane quasi celestial phoenix? Yeah, uh, really quick. Penguin witch doctor posted. Wait, a teethling can become a lent. Uh, a where lentiscope, basically rare creature. Um, not you can't. I believe you cannot be a tiefling and a beastkin because they're both versatile heritages. It's one or other, but they're you could work. I want to say you could work with your GM to have uh, your tiefling be under the effects of lentherpy as a werewolf. It it it's a it's a it's a thing. So because they're versatile, they don't have their base stats. They basically just add on to whatever their core yeah. ancestry is. So like for example, you could be an elven tiefling, or it could be an elven beastling or beastkin. Uh, if you really just want to be a full tiefling, if you will, um, you could probably make something work whereby you take the human template and then remove all the human feats and keep the human HP, mm. and put in all the tiefling versatile heritage feats. Yeah. Uh, oh, P- Penguin, which I posted, no, uh, Reef Psyche said that they they were they had a tiefling wear raven. yeah. Uh, before that uh, Reef Psyche posted, that could be nuts, I had a character that was a tiefling, draconic bloodline sorcerer, wear raven, part human, part fiend, part dragon, part burb. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's with a different system than uh, Pathfinder 2E. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, like, it, in that system... That, now, remind me, because I, I think, is the Were Raven from the new Cauldron book, or is that was that, like, a homebrew uh, feat that's ability? Kind of. Uh, it's part of... It's already established as part of the, the Raven Queen uh, court. It's more of an organization, honestly. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, oh, Malice1974 posted, In D&D 2nd Edition, I was in a game where all of us were races from the monstrous humanoid books who were enlisted who were enlisted the army as scouts, and one of the players picked a flying race and flew up into the air to check the area and was immediately shot down. Ooh. Um... Rip like he said also, the Were-Raven was in the Strahd campaign. Sounds cool. Still sounds dope. Yeah. Um, well... We are doing great on time, and as time, we're going to take a quick uh, five-minute break. Before we do, want to quickly reach out to the chat because we're about to do our awesome build time with you guys to chat. Uh, we had a few ideas. Last week, uh, when we, we mentioned a build, we were going to build a fetchling uh, society group of people called the Light Eaters. Now, we can go back and build that and figure out what that organization would be like, mm-hmm. what some cool powers of theirs might be, maybe even turn it into like an archetype for the future, or... We can sit here and take out our calculators and just crunch out some delicious math and figure out what is the fastest moving class combination in all Pathfinder 2E. So let us know the chats. And when we come back after our five minute break, we're going to kind of peek in the chat and see what you guys mm-hmm. talk about. And that'll be our build when we come back in five yeah. minutes. Oh, uh, really quick Penguin Witch Doctor posted Oh, could the beast can have a bullhead and get a gore attack? I don't see why not. Yet to know. They absolutely could, but it would be a reskin or reflavor of mm-hmm. their natural attack weapon. Yeah. But it's absolutely plausible. It's plausible. Oh, that was such an amazing time. There are so many crazy builds you can do with the Beastkin and mm-hmm. the Strix for speed, for damage, and just for, for pure fun. My God. Well, uh, as always, uh, it's time to say our goodbyes, and we look forward to hanging out with you again. Well, we may cover more ancestries, or we may have a special surprise for you. We'll see what life shows us or gives us. But uh, please, Mr. Michael Powell, tell them who you are and where we can find you on that sweet, sweet internet. Well, I am Michael Powell. You can find me all over the internet on my social media, which is at Mr. Kapow. That's M-R-K-A-P-A-O. Or my Facebook page, which is Facebook.com slash Michael Powell does stuff because I do a lot of stuff, such as my YouTube channel, which is 
youtube.com slash fantastic tales of adventure and yeah we just recently did our 100th story video and we got some uh, really cool stuff coming out and on thursdays uh let's see 6 p.m pacific standard time on the toyzilla network uh twitch channel i'm part of a show called toyzilla live where we talk about toy news and nostalgia so a lot of really fun stuff there how about you uh, my name is PJ Maga. You can find me all over the internet at PJ Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Come on, let's have a fun time. Uh, when I'm not here with Mr. Michael Powell on Tuesdays, you can find me here Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for Edge of Legend, the epic homebrew Pathfinder Second Edition game with a whole world and, and cultures and magic and gods made up just for this world. It's a lot of fun, and some of the things we do on the show poke up in that show. So come on, join us for both and have a great time as we become legends right along with you uh i gotta go in a really quickly because i'm going to be on life action role play as we do the armageddon boardroom about angels and demons battling out in the boardroom for the end of days uh so i gotta get ready to become an angel uh so please check it out life action role play tonight at 8 p.m on twitch backslash life action role play i'll see you then bye bye